morning, I want to talk about something that is very simple, very practical. Uh, I want to use this bottle of water here that has been placed on the table as an illustration of what I want to talk about. When you look at this bottle of water, I want you to think about the bottle itself as representing your life. You are a vessel, according to the scriptures, an earthen vessel in which God has placed his glory. God's put his glory right here in, inside of you. So the glory of God and the good works that God has prepared for you to do, all of the anointing and all of the gifts of the Spirit, they're all represented by the water that's inside of the vessel, the bottle itself. The Bible says in John chapter 7, and Jesus is speaking, and he said that out of our innermost being, out of our inner man would flow what? Rivers of living water. And he spoke this in reference to the Holy Spirit who had not yet been poured out. Now we know from Acts chapter 2 that the Spirit of God was poured out and people were baptized in the Holy Ghost. And Jesus said you'll receive power when the Spirit of God has come upon you. And we know that we've got the promise that God lives inside of us and that the Spirit of God will flow out of us. So we've got everything that we need right here. We've got the vessel. You're the vessel, I'm a vessel. And so uh, the water inside represents the Spirit of God and all that he brings into our lives, the supernatural ministry of God, the power of God, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead operating in us. And uh, we have one other thing that I haven't talked about yet, and that's the thing that's right at the top, and that's called a what? It's called a cap. So I can go like this. And I can go like this, and nothing happens. You know, I can go like this, and I'm not getting any benefit out of what's inside of this bottle. The bottle is perfect. It's not damaged. There's no defect in the bottle. Uh, the water is pure, and it's meant to be shared. It's there for a reason. It's not meant to be just put on display. It's not meant to just sit on a shelf. It's not going to do any good sitting there. But in order for benefit to come and for people to be blessed by what's inside of this bottle, something's got to come off. Amen. And, and uh, that something is what? Yeah. It's the cap, isn't it? So this is a little bit of a trendy term, and I don't want to throw you here, but what we're going to talk about today is, uh, is how by the power of God and the authority that we've been given in Jesus' name, we can bust a cap. So I'll let you just get over that. Just get over yourself now for just a minute. The Bible says, you're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. We know that Jesus teaches in this same portion of Scripture. It's recorded in his Sermon on the Mount. He talks about not doing things publicly. This seems to be kind of a contradiction, doesn't it? Because he's saying that you're the light of the world. Some people are, are astonished when they hear me say that. And I didn't say it. I'm just simply repeating what Jesus said. Because we think, well, Jesus is the light of the world. And we know from John chapter 1 that light has come into the world. And people love darkness rather than the light, so we believe that God is light, you know, and in him there is no darkness at all. But God has declared over me and over you that we are light, and we are the light of the world. At the same time, the Lord said, don't give to be seen by men when you give. And he's not talking about giving tithes and offerings. He's talking about almsgiving. He's talking about giving to the poor. He said, when you give to the poor, just, just don't make a big deal of it. Just, just do it secretly, just give. You, you don't do it to get credit for it. You don't do it to be seen by man. And you don't do it so people will label you a, a generous person or a do-gooder. Just do that privately. Let that be done privately. We know that the, the, the tithing was done publicly because Jesus watched people do it. And observed the widow woman put in the little widow's mite. And we know that that was something that was done publicly. Jesus said, but don't do your giving that way so that you're motivated by a desire to be seen by man. Don't do your praying motivated by a desire to be seen by men. Don't do your fasting, 
motivated by a desire to be seen by men. But now he's got a whole other thing going on over here where he says there are good works that God has prepared for you to do before you were ever born that you can only do by the power of the Holy Ghost. And those works, I want people to see. I don't want that to be done privately. I don't want that to be done secretly. I've got stuff for you to do that I want everybody to see so you can be the light of the world so my Father can be glorified. Amen? Amen? Yeah. When you think about your life, you're not meant to live that part of your life in, in private or in secret. You're not meant to be a secret agent. You're not meant to be an undercover person. As a matter of fact, the cover or the lid or the, the basket that is placed upon the light obstructs it and it has to be removed just like that bottle cap has to be removed so that what's inside can be seen and felt and experienced. So you don't put something out there and then put a cap on it. God has set us free so that we can fulfill our purpose and our potential and the things that God has called us to do in Christ are things we can't do in our own strength and within the, the framework of that calling and within the framework of that unique destiny that God has for you, you're going to have to confront certain caps that want to stop you from going where you're supposed to go. There are things that I'm going to have to face and I'm going to have to deal with that are stopping me from hitting the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There are things that probably even today that I'm not walking in, I'm not standing in, that I was supposed to stand in maybe a year ago or even 10 years ago, but because of some kind of a cap in my life, I'm not there yet. So I'm not even really on time as far as God is concerned because there are things that God has ordained that you walk in in certain seasons of your life. But better late than never. So at a certain point, we have to recognize that there are some things that I'm just not going to be able to just keep praying about because I've been sitting here praying about it forever. That I've got to recognize that God has put something in me and God has already declared certain things and God has said that you are the light of the world and so I am who God says that I am. And whatever this basket is, whatever this cover is, whatever this cap is, it's some little dumb thing. And it's got to come off. It doesn't amount to much in comparison to the rest of what God's got going on. The vessel is good. The vessel's actually bigger and more powerful. The cap is tiny. The water inside is more plentiful, has more volume, has more weight than the cap. The cap is a light little thing that's meant to be what? Removed and just discarded. You don't eat it. You don't save it. It's, it's meant to just be removed. It's got to be removed. And it's got to be removed in order to get stuff in there. And it's got to be removed to get stuff out of there. And the cap has got to come off of our lives. So the, the, the thing that we deal with many times is just simply not recognizing that there are these types of things functioning in our lives as a stopper or an impediment something that is in the way that is supposed to be removed out of the way, we don't even recognize that. You've dealt with people, haven't you? And you said, they're good at this and this and this, and then you said the word, but there's this one thing. And what is that one thing that you've identified? That's the cap right there. This person could get promoted if it wasn't for the cap. This person could advance in life and be successful if it wasn't for the cap. This person would have a successful relationship with, with his or her family if it wasn't for the cap. If we could just remove the cap. The cap is always some small, stupid thing that's got to be removed. You know, if this individual could just get a handle on this and get that out of their life, then they could flow, they could flourish, they could function, they could be blessed. Their light would really shine. But that little thing is, and, and they don't even know it. They don't even know that it's there. That is, that's sad, isn't it? How do, you, how do you help somebody that has an issue that doesn't see that they have an issue? How do you help somebody that doesn't even believe they have a problem? You really can't. I cannot help anybody that does not recognize the same problem that I see. If you don't see it, it doesn't matter what I see. You have to see it too. If you see it and I see it, we can partner together and maybe I can be of some assistance to you to help you to remove the cap but if you don't see it, if you don't recognize it, if you don't believe it, if you don't accept it, if you don't, if you don't deal with it, and, and it's just not something you can, you can wrap your head around, then, then you're just stuck. And that's a tragedy, isn't it? And there are people that live their entire life and never realize that they're not making progress, they're not growing, their light's not really shining like it's supposed to shine, 
because that cap is still intact. It's never been removed. The second worst thing is for people to know that they have a cap in their life, to know that they have an issue in their life, and to accept it and to do nothing about it. I can remember years ago talking to a man who was an officer who uh, had uh, retired from the Marine Corps, and, uh, and I was actually dealing with him about anger issues at the time, and he became angry, and in the process of becoming angry with me, he admitted to me that his anger had cost him an opportunity to become a general officer because they, they, they could handle a little bit of anger and some outbursts and some temperamental behavior and whatever, some fussiness. They could handle that at a, at a, at a lower level, but, but there was no room for that. A general had to be trusted to be able to hold his peace and keep his temper. And because this person had demonstrated that there were times when he could not do that, the temper was, was the thing that capped him. It capped his career. It kept him from being able to advance. And he recognized it, and he knew it was there, but yet when I was trying to help him to deal with it, he wouldn't, he wouldn't let me. He wouldn't do anything about it. He wouldn't do anything about it. So the only thing more tragic than a person who doesn't see it is a person who does see it and just simply chooses to live with it. So what have you chosen to live with that you recognize years ago was something that was holding you back from making progress? Because we can identify some of these things even from childhood. Because most of the time, the caps are things that uh, have always been with us. They've always been a part of our life, always been a part of our personality. It's very seldom that we pick up new caps as we go along through life. Usually the caps are unique to us, our temperament, our personality, so much so that people are able to write books about it. And people are able to measure it. They're able to see. There's, there are patterns here. And certain types of people have certain types of things. If you have this type of a temperament, if you have this type of a personality, here are the caps that will probably be present in your life. And if you've taken those tests, and you've taken those personality profiles, and you've done some strength finders, you realize that they know absolutely what they're talking about because this is something that is known. And yet people will do it, and they'll take the test, and the test will say, this is a cap in your life, and people will just say, okay, and go on and just live with it. Just live with it. I think that's one of the most tragic things about life is to watch people do that. I want to be a person that's constantly facing the challenge of removing those things that are capping me from fulfilling the purpose and the potential of God for my life. I want to give you an example of just something that, that was capping us. And uh, we were being capped, and we are being capped in terms of what we're capable of doing by the very building that you're sitting in right now. And in order for us to do what God has called us to do and be who God has called us to be and occupy the place that God has called us to occupy in the earth, we could not sit still and accept that this would cap the growth of this church or that it would cap the future generation from being able to go forward and do what God has called it to do. No way. So was it useful in the past? Absolutely. Is it useful now? No. Now it's a cap. And it's got to be busted if we're going to be able to go forward and be who God has called us to be. Years ago when we were in a storefront, we could hold about, about 200 people max packed out. We could park maybe 30 cars. And as, as we began to understand who God had called us to be, we realized that we cannot live under this cap. This is, this is a literal cap that is capping the growth of this church. And we're not, meant, we're not a church of 200. God didn't call me to pastor 200. That God has given us more than that. Amen. That our destiny is bigger than that. Yes. Absolutely. Amen. Some of you are looking at me like, what are you talking about? I'm just, listen to me. Amen. There are things like this in life. And we'll just say, well, we're just going to live under this thing. No. And we'll just, we'll just have to live under it. And uh, if this is what we have, it must be God's will. And we have hyper, hyper doctrines, excessive doctrines of the sovereignty of God. And yes, there are times when God will sovereignly come in and remove a cap from a person's life. But most of the time, that does not happen. Normally, God gives you the authority to do that, the power to do that. He expects me to do that. And i got to take steps of faith. That's where faith really comes into play. One of the works of faith is to remove caps from our life that keep us from doing what God has called us to do. That's how we demonstrate faith. Faith without works is dead. When you see a person using their faith... You see them removing barriers and obstacles, saying to mountains, be thou removed, so that I can go forward and be who God has called me to be. And what is tragic is to preach to people. Year after year after year, 
and see by the Spirit of God in them that they're not living up to their potential. Their light is not shining like it's supposed to shine. And to realize there's not a blessed thing you can do about it. Many times they don't see it. Sometimes it's willful blindness. Sometimes they get it, but they do nothing about it. Hearers of the word, but not practitioners of the word. That was a great word, pastor, for someone else who's got a cap like that in your life, and you just want to shake them and say, I was talking to you. God was talking to you. So sit up straight now. Because God is talking to you. He's talking to us. I'm looking at this and thinking about things that I know God has told me to do and just realizing that there's a cap in the way. That's why it's not happening. And I can pray about it for the rest of my life. And I can talk about it and I can journal. I mean, you can think about it for the rest of your life, but at some point, you've got to confront it and realize what's inside is too good to be left there. I can't die with this cap on my life. I can't go to the grave with this cap on my life. There's no way. i got to get it off. Somehow i got to get it off. And God's given us the authority. God's given us the anointing. God's given us the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. So I'm going to talk quickly about a few things this morning as much as we can, and then we'll have to stop. But the first one is the word cap. The Bible says, then Caleb, this is uh, Numbers 13, then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him, this was when they were going to go up against Jericho, but the men who were, who were with him and had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. So one of the smallest caps in life that has to be removed from our life is the cap of just simply saying two words when God speaks to us, and we respond to him with two words, and those two words are, I can't. I can't. When you say, I can't, you have just put a cap on everything. So now God looks at you and says, well, there's not much I can do with you until you remove that cap. I didn't say that over you. I said you could do it. I said go in and take it. But you say, I can't. And until you say, I can, here we go. We're just, that's it. There's nothing we can do. And these people were so stubborn and stiff-necked that God knew they're never going to change their minds about this. When they say, I can't, they mean it. They don't just mean it today. They just mean it, period. That's just it. I'm just an I can't person. I can't do it. I can't make it. I can't handle it. I can't take it anymore. I can't. I can't. I can't. Well, you have just put a real low cap on your life. And that cap's got to come. You, you said it. So you got to revoke it. you got to remove it. It was you that did it. You said you couldn't do it. God didn't say you couldn't do it. God said you can. And until you stop saying, I can't, there's the cap right there. And then you get mad at God. I get mad at God. Why can't we get this? And why can't we have And I've been praying and asking God. No. You can pray and ask God for the rest of your life, but that cap is in the way. You put it there, you got to get it. you got to remove it. You said it, you got to unsay it. Yep. You, you, you gave it power. You gave it license to be where it is. Right. Now you got to revoke the license that you gave it and, and, and rebuke it and renounce it and reject it and repent of it and say, God, I'm never doing that again. Amen. I'm not going to run around for the rest of my life making excuses and saying, I can't, I can't, I can't. When God has filled me with the Holy Ghost and said, I set you on fire and you are a light and a flame with the power of the Holy Ghost, and I didn't put a basket on you. I didn't cover you up. You've covered your own self up with the words of your mouth. Some of us are smothering the flame with the words of our mouth. So God says, you've got to rebuke that. You've got to revoke that. And I'll tell you something else. This is an example of the older generation capping the younger generation. They had an older generation that said, 
we can't. And they spoke on behalf of the younger generation. And what did God do? God said, okay, now this cap is going to last for 40 years. And, and, and sometimes what God will do, see, they didn't remove it. They didn't revoke it. They didn't repent of it. They were still as stiff-necked and rebellious as they'd always been. So what happened was that piece by piece, God just destroyed the cap. One by one, they died in the desert. And God didn't move them over to the promised land until the whole cap was removed. That every last person in that generation had to go into the dust so that their children could rise up and possess the promise. That's not who God has called this generation to be. This older generation is not called to, be, to put a cap on the younger generation, to criticize it, to, uh, to speak against it. There are, there are some people, even Christian people, who are so negative and they say so many negative things that their children are afraid to get married and their children are afraid to have children. Because, because somebody in the older generation is scared to death about how kids are going to be raised in this wicked, wicked, wicked world in which we live. And I'll tell you what, the world has always been wicked, 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 and yet God told us to go out, be fruitful, and multiply. And so because the righteous are not having kids and the wicked are having kids right and left, we got a problem. We got a problem. One generation is, is putting a lid on the fruitfulness of another generation. In every sense. In every sense. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? When we build this new building now and finish it and occupy this building, not only are we taking the cap off of ourselves in the generation that I'm a part of, but we're removing the cap for the next generation. I felt like our job is to make sure that they're not capped. That they got room to grow. That they got no excuse. If they don't do it, I won't be here. I won't be able to ball them out. But I'll tell you what. They will not be able to say that I built us into a corner somewhere that was so tiny that there was no future for us. No further development was possible. No further growth was possible because Pastor Chris lived under such a low cap that now we can't do nothing with all these expensive buildings. We can't grow. We can't do nothing. And we have busted that cap and remove that off of our neck. That's the will of God. That's the will of God. I don't know what you're saying to yourself. I don't know what excuses you're making. But we better check ourselves and watch the words of our mouth to make sure that we're not speaking caps in, instead of speaking cans. Lose the cap and get a can. I can. Say it with me. I can. Say it again. I can. Say it again. I can. Really? Are you sure? Are you sure? Within the context of the call of God and the destiny that God has chosen for your life, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Now, I'm not called to play basketball, so I cannot say that I can dunk a basketball, but that's not within the framework of the call of God on my life. But everything that is within that framework, I can do it. Everything that's within your framework, the call of God on your life, the destiny he's chosen for you, the path you're called to walk, you can do it Amen. in Jesus' name. Amen. Number two is the people cap. Here's what the Bible says. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. And then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying... Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he, Jesus, turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. You know what the word offense is? Not, not, not Jesus was touchy and emotional and saying, You're offending me. An offense literally means you're a stumbling block to me. You're, you're a stone of stumbling that, that, that is in my way. You're not mindful of the things of God but the things of men. What can happen in our relationships with people that, 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 is, that is tricky for all of us is that there are people around us probably right now who are capping our potential to be who God's called us to be, to do what God has called us to do. And some of these people are well-intentioned. And some of these people are very, very close to us like Peter was very close to Jesus. And yet Peter was talking about things and saying things, immediately after saying the right things, all of a sudden now, he's the devil's spokesman. 
And, and he's well-intentioned. He doesn't realize it. He doesn't realize it. This is where we kind of look at this and we say, is it possible that somebody like that could be used by the devil that way to be a cap on somebody else's life? I mean, how, how could that possibly be? But yet it is possible. It is, it's possible. I, I've seen parents who love their children put caps on their kids' lives. Cap their child's life. By, by just simply saying, no, I don't want you to do this. I don't want you to do that. I, I, I want you to, I, I feel like this is what you're supposed to do. This is what I expect you to do. What happened with Jesus? The people in his life. They, they came to him in the middle of his preaching. They said, your mother and your brothers are outside. You know what they were there to do? Put a cap on this whole Jesus thing. You know, uh, they, were, they were, Mary was worried about him. You know, the boy's not getting any sleep. He's not eating right. He's hanging, about, he's hanging around with a bunch of strangers that we don't know. I don't know these guys. I don't know who Peter is. He looks pretty rough to me. I don't know. They're fishermen. They're not, they're not, you know, they're not in our class. I don't know what these guys are all about. I don't know who's influencing him. I don't know what's happening. I'm, I'm here to protect my son. I'm here to take him home. I'm here to, I love him. I want what's best for him. And we think that we know what's best. And so what did Jesus do? He didn't have any of that. Nope. You know, I love you, Mom, but, but you're not going to cap my life. You're not going to be a cap on my life. You're, that's, not your, that's not what you're supposed to do. He knew exactly what he was supposed to do. He knew exactly who he was. He was being led by the Spirit of God. Does that mean that we don't have the right to parent our kids, that we don't have the right to correct them, to rebuke them, to, to be concerned about the decisions that they're making, to recognize that sometimes, I mean, I remember when I was, when I was a young person, I had to make a change in the direction of my life when I, was a sophomore, when I was a freshman in college. And when you're a freshman in college, you think you are really big stuff. And you think that now I have reached the age of majority, now I am an adult, now I even voted. And, uh, and I, you know, I am somebody. And you think that, that you know what you're doing. And, and as you get older, you look back and you think, well, you were just an idiot. And you were just a dumb kid. I mean, you weren't growing up at all. You didn't have any responsibilities. I mean, the, the heaviest burden in your life was, was, was some kind of a college course. That was the only thing that you had to worry about was a test. I mean, come on. What are you talking about? But I had to make a change. And I can remember my dad calling me every night for a week because the expectation that he had and had always had for me now suddenly was threatened. And I was beginning to move in a direction that scared him. And out of his concern for me, and his desire that I not make some of the mistakes that he made, he, he really put a lot of pressure on me. And I had to, I had to really dig down, and, and every night I had to defend what it was that I felt like God was saying to me. And to my dad's credit, he, he, after a week, he felt like he had done his job. I have done what I'm responsible to do. I've warned him. I've counseled him. I've, I've talked to him about all the different things that he needs to think about so that he can make a wise decision, but ultimately, it's his life now, and he's going to have to make that choice. And my dad stepped back, and, and he said, I will not be a cap on this boy's life. I'm going to, if he, if he wins, if he loses, if he succeeds, if he fails, I've got to let him try to follow God, and I've got to let him try to hear from God for himself. I, he has to go through this, and so I'm going to have to let him go. I'm going to have to let it happen. So you don't want to be the person that lords it over somebody else's faith. I have to be careful as a pastor that I don't lord it over your faith, that I don't become a cap on your life and tell you that uh, and hold you down or hold you back. There are times when we need to be restrained. There are times when, when we're not ready, when it's not time. But, but at the end of the day, uh, God has called the fivefold ministry, according to Ephesians chapter 4, not to place caps on people's lives, but to remove caps from people's lives, to teach them how to flow and how to become who God has called them to be, to prepare them for the work of the ministry. And part of the preparation for the work of the ministry is busting caps off your life. Because we come with those already built in. You came from your home with a cap on your life. You came to Jesus with a cap on your life. Already built in. And then what we learn by faith and what we experience when we experience God is this tremendous desire to be free from those things. And then we experience this confidence and this sense of strong belief that I don't have to live under this anymore. I always thought this was the way it was always going to be. 
People told me that this was the way it was always going to be. And I've had family around me reinforcing this and friends around me reinforcing this. And now I see that God has called me to something and this is in the way. And how, how am I going to deal with it? I'm going to have to say, get behind me, Satan. Get out of my way. Mountain, be removed. Cap, you're coming off in the name of Jesus. I will not live under a lid. My light is to shine so men will see my good works and glorify my Father who is in heaven. And I'm not going to let those good works be diminished. I'm not going to let them be covered up. I'm not going to let them be capped and bottled up so that nobody is blessed by them and nobody receives what God has put inside of me. I'm going to be free, and I'm going to be free in Jesus' name because whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Amen. But many times we have to take steps. We have to take steps. I've had situations where, where uh, even, even certain types of ministries where you've got somebody who's leading that ministry, leaders can become lids if they're not careful. And God didn't call us to become a lid on anything. And I've had, I've had situations in the past and people that I've dealt with and things that I've had to go through that have not been easy, but I've had to make a choice between living under that person's cap or, or taking that cap off and just simply saying, we're going to let this thing grow. Amen. We're going to let it go where it's supposed to go. And it can't go where it's supposed to go because this person is limiting the growth of what God's called us to do. And sometimes that can be in a different area of the ministry. And oftentimes what you'll see is something struggle and struggle and struggle until that leader that is over that ministry that has been capping it for whatever reason is removed and then all of a sudden there's just an explosion of growth. And that area of the ministry just takes off like a rocket. Recently, I just came back from Rio de Janeiro. We were there for a conference, Pastor Marco Peixoto, a good friend of ours. And we did a conference there, and I, I spoke at the conference, and, and uh, he was sharing with us about one of the satellite churches there in Rio that was the, actually the first one that they planted, the first church that they planted. And he told me that the pastor of that church came to him and said, uh, I need to step aside. And Pastor Marco said, you know, that church has always been kind of frustrating for us because the potential is there, but it just never took off. It was the first one we planted. We had high hopes for it. We had high expectations, but it just never went. Just never, it didn't correspond to the rest of the work that God has called this ministry to do. And so other churches were exploding. Other things were happening. Other ministries were growing. And this one was always, it was always just sort of flatlined. It was always just kind of a struggle. It was just so-so. It wasn't bad enough for us to shut it down, but it wasn't really something that we were proud of. It wasn't really something that we were looking at and seeing the hand of God and the power of God operating. And this, I know the pastor, and I've actually preached in that church myself, and he's a wonderful man of God. He loves God, but I'm telling you what he did. This is one of the most heroic and selfless things, and, and you may feel bad for him, but now just wait a minute. Think about it. He just stepped aside. He said, I think that it's me. I think it's me. I think that I think there needs to be a change. And uh, you see, it doesn't do any good to get a new bottle because the bottle is not the problem. And the water inside the bottle is not the problem. The cap is the problem. And the cap's got to come off. So he stepped aside, and as soon as he stepped aside, boom, this thing is exploding. One of the members of the church came up and said, I have a building, and I want the church to use this building. And the building now will allow them to go from about a 350, 400-seat auditorium to a 1,200-seat auditorium. And, uh, and so <laughs> things are just happening like, like crazy. All of a sudden, it's like there's new life in that work. And it was because somebody stepped aside. And because they stepped aside in a heroic, selfless way, recognizing that not only was there a cap, but that they were it. And they loved God and the kingdom of God too much to be a cap and not, and not get out of the way. I'll tell you what, sometimes people are so stubborn that in the effort to remove them, it's like sometimes you've had this experience where you tried to get the cap off something and it was so stubborn you actually damaged the bottle. You destroyed the vessel trying to get the cap off because it just would not come off. You couldn't screw it off with your hands. You went and got a, got a big, you know, wrench or something like that, got a big pair of channel locks and tried to tear it off. And what you wound up doing is actually twisting the head. The cap never did come off. You just twisted the bottle in half and destroyed the bottle in the process. That's how stubborn some caps can be. Sometimes people just have to step aside. I have to realize that there is a season for me to be in a certain place 
And then I have to be willing to recognize when that season is up because if I don't, I can overstay and become a cap to growth. I can do something for a while because no one else can do it. I used to lead praise and worship because nobody else could do it. And then after a while, when people could do it that could do it better than I did, I had to step aside and say, I'm not doing this anymore. And the closest I ever get is to sing in a chorus or two when I come up to change things around. And that's about as close as I can get to it these days. But I had to step aside and say, this is somebody else's thing now. Amen. And if I stay here, the praise and worship ministry is not going to grow. It is not going to be what God has called it to be. I'm in the way. I've got to step out of the way. And we've got to come to a point where we recognize that we, we may have to do that sometimes. And we have to come to the point where we recognize that there are people, even parents, even loved ones, even people like Mary who loved her son, even people like Peter who loved Jesus and said, I would die for you. And they become a cap. And we have to say, you got to get behind me. I, I can't live under your expectations. I can't live under what you think I should do and what you think and what you've decided. I can't live under your opinions anymore. I'm going to have to be who God has called me to be. Unfortunately, sometimes people are married to people who are capping some of their potential. And then you'll, you'll get to the point where you'll say, well, um, you know, I just can't do this and I can't do this and I can't be... We get in our head that because we're married to this person, we can't do what God has called us to do. And I'll tell you what, I'm not saying that you get a divorce. I'm not saying that you, you know, dump your friends. I'm just saying that you just look at your friends and you look at your spouse and you look at your situation and you're the one that has decided that they're a cap. You accepted it. You believed it. You actually took it on and, 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 and held on to it. And, and that's not their fault, is it? Because they don't even know that they're a cap in your life, do they? they? They didn't come into your life saying, well, I'm gonna stop you from fulfilling your potential. They're just doing it. It's just happening. But it's only happening because that's what you believe and that's what you accept. That's what you accept. And so there has to come a time when you just flip the switch and you say, okay, I'm not gonna use that person as an excuse anymore. Amen. And God, I'm gonna step out and I, I'm, I'm gonna still stay married to them, but I'm gonna start flowing and fulfilling and letting my light shine and do what yeah. you called me to do. And and, and I'm going to still be friends with them, but, but I'm not going to permit that that friendship should be a cap in my life. And so if, if, if I do what God's called me to do, and I obey God like God's called me to obey God, I can't control their reaction. They may freak out, but uh, that's on them. That's on them. That's their problem. They'll have to deal with that. But I refuse to any longer go to God and say, oh, this cap is so big, it's so strong, it's so... You know, it's, it's just, oh, whatever it is. I just, I'm not going to do that anymore. I believe that God is greater than this cap. And I'm going to live above the cap in Jesus' name. I'm going to live above the cap in Jesus' name. I'm coming out in the mighty name of Jesus. And so God will help us to be able to do that. God will bless us if we will trust him in this area of our life. And so you see that words can do it. And you see that people can do it. And all of us have words that we're living under. And we just use a simple example of just, just those two simple words that cap most of our, of our accomplishments in life. I can't do it. It's too late. I can't do it. It's too hard. I don't have this. I don't have that. And those words then are a cap that I have placed to limit my own life and to limit the light that God has placed inside of me. And I did it. And God gives me the authority to undo it. And remove the cap in Jesus' name. Uh, people come around us. Some people we don't have any choice. Like your family, you're just born with your family. You're kind of stuck with your family. And, and you can either allow your family to become a cap. Or, or you can be like Abraham. And God spoke to Abraham and said, get away from your family. He didn't say hate your family. He didn't say dishonor your father and your mother. He just said, get away from them. You're going to have to come out of your country. Come out of your kindred. Just get out of there. Thank God for the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps got you out. Amen. Now the Holy Ghost is going to get you in. Yeah. Amen. If God got you out, be careful about going back. Because when you go back, you know what's going to happen. You know what's going to happen. You're going to come under that cap. Whatever that family spirit is. Whatever that level of faith is. Here you've got faith for everything. You get around your family, you've got faith for nothing. Here you know how to talk right. You get around your family, you start talking wrong. 
Here you know how to think right. You get around your family, you start thinking wrong. You start thinking like they think. They never got out. They never got out from underneath the cap. They're still living under the cap. You're the one that got out. And that's why there's more flowing in your life. That's why there are things happening in your life. And that's not always the case. That's not always the case. It doesn't always have to be the case, but it was with Abraham. There are people that have situations in their life that are similar to the situation that, um, you know, we see in Moses' life where they have something humiliating that took place in their past. They did something that didn't work out. They tried to do something for God and, it, and, and they failed miserably and they're humiliated and they're embarrassed. And Moses lived for 40 years under that embarrassment. And he lived for 40 years under that failure. And then you see in, in, in the book of Exodus in chapter 2, 3, and 4, in those three chapters, you see the back and forth and back and forth as the Lord, after setting a bush on fire out in the desert, begins to remove the cap off of Moses' life so he can go back and actually let his light shine like it's supposed to. He tried to do it before, and it got put out. He tried to do it before, and he looked like a fool. Now God's coming back to him and saying, okay, 40 years have gone by, and you've lived under this cap long enough, and now it's time for it to come off, and now I'm sending you back to the place of your failure, to the place of your humiliation, to the place of your embarrassment, and this time, God's going to get glory, and your light is going to shine, and you are going to accomplish the purpose for which I send you. But he could have lived under that, and he tried to, and argued with God back and forth and back and forth. Tried to stay under that. No, I can't do it now, God, because I, I messed up too bad. No, I couldn't go back there now, Lord, because there are people that would remember me, and it, and it would just be too embarrassing. Nobody would believe me. Nobody would, what am I going to do when I go back? Remember he said, what will I say? When I go back, those people know who I am. They'll remember me. They know what a fool I was. They know what a failure I was. And I tell them that I'm, I'm, I'm coming back to deliver them. I mean, they're not going to believe that. And God said, would you tell them that I am sent you? I am sent you. You're not coming in your own name. I sent you. I sent you back. And you just do what I tell you to do. Just trust me and just do what I tell you to do. But you've got to come out from under this thing. I don't know what you did in the past. I don't know how big a fool you made out of yourself, but probably uh, about as big a fool as I've made out of myself in the past. We've all made fools out of ourselves. I can't live under that. God didn't call me to live under the cap of foolishness. God called me to shake that thing off and keep going in Jesus' name. I got to keep going. I've done dumb things, but I'm going to keep going. I've been embarrassed, but I got to keep going. I've made mistakes, but I got to keep going. I can't live under those things and make those things the thing that caps me and stops me from being who God has called me to be. Somewhere, somehow, my light's got to shine so God can get some glory. Amen? I'm not a secret agent. I'm not wanting to be a, a private citizen. Amen? I'm a citizen of the kingdom set on fire by God, meant to light the world. And that's who God made you to be. There are people like Peter that were pretty well set to just live under the shame of denying Christ three times. Pretty well set to just go back to fishing. Go, just go back to fishing. I've crossed the line here. I mean, I did something nobody else has ever done. You know, none of the other disciples did this. They all ran for their lives, but at least they kept their mouth shut. And I was the one that actually said, I don't know him, I don't know him, I don't know him. How do you get over that? How does that cap your life? When words like that come out of your mouth, how do you overcome that? How do you get past that and get on to the next thing for the glory of God? How does that work? And Jesus had to get after him. Say, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. And he asked him again, Peter, do you love me? You really love me? I love you. The third time, and then Peter was grieved. He said, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, well, just get out there. Don't live under this anymore. It's over. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. I called you. I told you. I, you remember the day that I called you. And I told you that you were going to be a fisher of men. So you are not going back to fishing for fish. That ain't happening. My call on your life is, but I denied you. I, that's, hey, remove the cap. You got to bust that cap off your life. And keep going and do what God has called you to do. And these are responsibilities that every single one of us has. So we're going to go on with this because we're not done. And I've only given you two points and I have six. So we're, I've got everything, I've got every kind of cap in here that you can imagine except a nightcap. <laughs> and maybe a shower cap. I don't have a shower cap in here either. There's no shower cap, there's no nightcap, there's no, I don't have that. 
But I just about every other kind of cap that you can think of in here. Because I want to hit everything that I can possibly hit. Because I know how people are. Sometimes when you're preaching, it's like playing dodgeball. Yeah. Whoop, you missed me. <laughs> Whoop, you hit the person beside me. Whoa, whoa, some of you are quick. You're quick. You can, you're, you can dodge. You can dodge. So I got to have a lot of balls. I got to throw a lot of balls. You know it. You know I do. You know I do. I got to throw a lot of balls. Some of you are real far away, so I really have to just really wind up and just whip it to hit you guys in the back. But I got you in the back. Amen? Amen. How many of you want to live a life that is just limited? How, how, how do you like driving a U-Haul that's got the governor set at 50? That's, there's no joy in that. I mean, you're going to go. I mean, it'll get you there. But it ain't fun. It ain't fun. It's, merging is not fun. There is no passing. You're not going to pass anybody. You're just, just you're not going to get there fast. You're, just, you're not going to accomplish much. Because there's a governor that's, that's been put on you by somebody else. And uh, you keep stomping the accelerator trying to go faster, trying to do better, and it's not happening. And why is that not happening? Because the governor has to be removed. He has to be disengaged. And, and you'd be very dissatisfied trying to take a drink of water out of that bottle unless the cap is removed. Amen. Unless the cap is removed. And God's given us the strength in the natural to remove caps and to access the treasure that's on the inside. And God has given us authority and power in the Holy Ghost to do the same thing in the realm of our life, our destiny, the plan of God, the purpose of God, the good works that God has prepared for us. God put those things in you. And I don't care if you're 15 or 50 or, you know, if you're, if you're 17 or 70. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It, there's, there's no bad time or bad season in life for caps to be busted off. No, no bad time for that. So you may feel like, well, it's too late now. Too much time has gone by, and I've lived under this cap my whole life. I don't even know how I would feel or how I would do or who I would be if I didn't live under this. Sometimes the cap becomes such a part of our identity that everybody knows, oh, don't ask her because she can't. Don't ask him because, you know, he's got this. He's whatever. And everybody knows what everybody else's, some of what everybody else's caps are. And they just know that certain things he can't do, she can't do because of this or because of that or because of the other. Wouldn't it be great if people stopped talking about us and saying, well, he can do this and this and this, and then they used the word but? Wouldn't it be great if they, if they said he can do this and this and this and he can also do this? Yeah, absolutely. And this is what God wants to do. He wants to remove one thing which caps us that word B-U-T is a little bottle cap. It's a little aggravating, dumb little thing. And we can twist it off, throw it away. And then it's replaced once it's open with now, now we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Amen. And God gives you the authority to do that. So you've prayed for years and years and years for God to just do something for you that God has given you the power and the authority to do for yourself. And that's what faith is all about. You just have to believe that as I take steps of obedience and I move out, and I begin to put pressure on that cap, it's going to break off. But I have to put pressure on it. And some of us have lived under it, and we've never put any pressure on it at all. We've never, take any, we've never taken any steps of obedience whatsoever. If you've, got, if you've got a problem in the natural, let's say you've got a problem and you're out of shape, how do you take the cap off your physical limitations? You put pressure on it. How do you put pressure on it? You go to the gym. You, you go into the kitchen and you start throwing things away. <laughs> Amen? You, you, uh, you, quit, you quit eating in restaurants. You put pressure. And as you put pressure, all of a sudden, boom, that cap is broken off of your life. And all of a sudden, now everybody sees it. Man, you're losing weight. You're getting in shape. You look different. You look better. There's, you're, you're sharp. You're, you're energetic. You, you, wow. And why did that happen? Because you, you, you went into a prayer closet and just prayed, oh, God. Oh, no, you put pressure on the cap. And the cap, did the cap, did the cap resist the pressure? Yeah, it resisted the pressure. But it wasn't, but you, you got it. Amen. You blew it off of there. You did it by faith. By faith and obedience. 
you did it. And God's called us to do the same thing with the caps on our life. If, if you've got an educational issue and you're being held back because you don't have a certain amount of education, how do you, what, do you, what are you going to do? Are you going to pray and just pray and pray and pray? No. You find out, what will it take to break this cap off my life? And then you begin to take steps of faith and you bust it off. And when it comes off, we cheer, we celebrate. Oh, it's awesome. Amen? And so God has called us together as a community of believers to have faith for one another. Not to look at each other and add to the strength of the cap by criticizing one another, but to look at one another and speak words of faith and life and encouragement. And, and instead of allowing, allowing you to say, I can't, or you allowing me to say, I can't, then we, we just correct each other. Oh, yes, we can. Yes. You can. Yes. You can. You can. Say it with me. I can. I can. I can. I can. In Jesus' name, I can. I can. And God's called us to not only say that, but to actually demonstrate that publicly to the world Amen. so that he, the Father will be glorified, Amen. so that men will see our good works and they'll glorify our Father who is in heaven. Amen? Amen. So who knows what's in you that is going to stay in you until you die and go into the grave. If that cap doesn't come off, that's what's going to happen, and that's a tragedy. And that's not the will of God. So everything that God put in you, all of that living water, we want to make sure that we pour out every last drop and then we go to be with Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. We don't leave anything under, under a cap. We take everything out from under, we take the cap off so that what's under the cap can come out and flow to the glory of God. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, now we thank you for your grace and for your mercy and for the tremendous power of the Holy Spirit so that even the stubborn caps that are upon our lives, the things that have been resistant, Lord, we thank you that none of them are a match for the power of the Holy Ghost. And so, Lord, we pray that our faith would rise up, and, Lord, that there would be a move that we would make, an action that we would take that would correspond to what we're hearing today. We wouldn't just live under these caps any longer. We wouldn't just accept them. We wouldn't just use them as excuses. But, Lord, give us the wisdom and the strategies that we need to take the steps of faith that will bust the caps off of our lives. So, Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for that. Give that to every one of us. Lord, I need it. We all need it. Release that wisdom, Lord, upon the church right now. Just pour it out. Pour it out, oh God, in the name of Jesus. Pour it out upon every person. Pour it out upon every person in the mighty name of Jesus. Just buckets of wisdom filled with strategy stirring up our faith, even stirring up an anger that the cap is still there. Lord, what we've accepted, and it doesn't even bother us anymore. Lord, bother us. Yeah. Bother us. Make us upset about it and angry that it's there. Don't let us make friends with it. Don't let us coddle it or cuddle it or accept it any longer. But Lord, to see it for what it is. It's, it's the same thing that Jesus saw when he looked at Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. Lord, we would see it as a demonic thing that's trying to hold us back and keep us from fulfilling our purpose and our destiny in Christ. Would you have